good evening. Uganda is currently reporting a worrying curve in the dangerous increase of COVID-19 positive cases. Hospitals are overwhelmed. Doctors have complained of lack of personal protective equipment. The vaccines have run short. And now more than ever, the testing, tracing, and stopping of COVID-19 seems to be out of sight. Today, the most trending statement on social media is rest in peace. People are dying, and the situation is dire. On the spot night is Dr. Jen Rutha Chang, the Minister of Health designate. We seek to find out what has become of Uganda's COVID-19 response and how can it all be salvaged. <laughs> Dr. Ruth Jenna Cheng, I want to thank you so much for having honored our invitation. Let me begin by, first of all, congratulating you for having been uh, re-elected by the people, for having been elected by the people of Lira, but also for having been nominated once again to be Minister of Health. Congratulations. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kamara, and I do deeply appreciate the people of Lira City who overwhelmingly showed me their love and support. And uh, in a special way, I want to thank His Excellency, the President, for putting trust in me again to head the health sector. Allow me to greet uh, the people who are listening to us. Good evening to you. Dr. Achang, are we losing the fight against the virus? Um, Mr. Kamara, that is uh, a difficult question to answer at this point in time. But allow me to encourage Ugandans. Uganda has the capacity to handle any outbreak whatsoever. And this capacity has been built over the years with the several outbreaks that we have had. Um, this particular pandemic is a social behavioral issue. It requires that me and you are responsible citizens and are determined to protect one another. And therefore it calls for the citizens of this country to work together with the teams that are handling the pandemic. We are not losing the battle. We just need the population to come on board and work in tandem with us and do whatever they are advised to do. For the people right now who are in hospitals that are highly overwhelmed, for the people right now who have just lost their loved ones, for those who are in ICU and, and HDU right now, when you tell them that we are not losing the battle, they just don't get you because the situation is dire. For them, it's more or less apocalyptic. Well, Mr. Kamara, um, if I may take you a little back, there are many countries who have gone even beyond the stage where we are. I don't think you want to say they lost the battle. There are stages where you reach a peak and you come down. But like I said, winning this battle depends on the individuals, the population of this country. And you will recall many times in my addresses, I always repeated, I said, the power to win this battle is in the hands of the population. And I want to repeat it again. It is in your hands. It is in your power. If you so determine that we are going to get out of the current situation, we'll get out of it. If the population give up and say, come what may, then we will see more disaster. Okay, you are the Minister of Health designate. So I think it is better for us... First of all, to understand, if you may, what is Uganda's status report on the pandemic? To be specific, what is the scale of infection from the tests you have been carrying out? Well, our positivity rate could be about 17 to 18 percent. That is extremely high, meaning um, the infection is widespread. And uh, from the tests that we do, a very high percentage are positive. Not all positive cases are severe or critical. Some of them are mild and some are asymptomatic. And that is why we don't admit everybody. We admit the severe and the critical. The moderate and the mild are taken care of under home-based care.
washing your hands. Find ways, just do something to keep yourself safe and healthy. You know, if this was a war, and I'm sure it is a war, Dr. Cheng, you are the general in the fight against the disease. How did we get here? How did we lose our guard? Because the country was being praised for doing a good job, and all of a sudden, the infection rates are so high, 17% is quite a big number, and I'm told now you can't even do uh, contact tracing because we have gone beyond that. So how did we lose it? Where did we lose it? Uh, Mr. Kamara, there is a clip of His Excellency the President in one of his addresses telling the people that we have told you all that we have to tell you. We have educated you on how to protect yourselves and you've still refused to listen. You're going to see deaths rising here. And when you see deaths, don't say we didn't tell you. I'm sure you've seen that clip. It's moving around. And that clip is a reminder of where we came from. In the first wave, we had a lockdown. Immediately we started getting cases, His Excellency instituted a lockdown. The lockdown was good. It prolonged the time for us to, you know, get into such a state. And two, the population was with us. If I can remind you, I think when there was a lockdown, perhaps you never even got out of your house. You respected the lockdown. You respected putting on masks. Hand washing facilities were everywhere. People were listening to what we were saying. Unfortunately, after the elections, during the month of January, February, March, people forgot that there was COVID in Uganda. Unfortunately, because the numbers of infections went so low, as low as five. And people were saying, but we don't have COVID anymore. So a lot of complacency set in. The masks were thrown away. Hand washing became a thing of the past. There was no more social distancing. So that is number one. Number two, the variants came in. And we made several statements. I came out and talked. We have five variants in the country. And these, ha these variants are highly transmissible. They are very aggressive and they cause high mortality. We told Ugandans, not once, not twice, we have variants. And we stated it very clearly. We said, these variants from science give a time period of two months to circulate into the country. After two months, we are going to see lots of cases. Please put on your masks. Nobody heeded to our talk. So the two issues brought us to where we are now, complacency and the variants. But you're also forgetting that strict enforcement of lockdown was possible in 2020 because to some people there was a political motive and interest to do that. And now it's as if the same government, the same ministry that was enforcing lockdown like never before, when actually death were lower, now they're not because you have no political dividend. Mr. Kamara, there was no political motive, absolutely. It was about lives of the people. Yeah, but now are dying more, it's more aggressive, let it's more transmissible, you. and yet you have not uh, thought let, about let protecting the lives like you Ms. did in the past. Mr. So Kamara. How can, I, how, how can I not deduce that there was another motive behind as well? Very good. Let me tell you this. We learned a lot of lessons from the lockdown. Many countries at that time were instituting lockdowns to try and control the pandemic. Many. It wasn't only Uganda. But there were lessons to learn from the lockdown. As a country like ours and the economy that we know. First of all, we had challenges with managing the other disease conditions. We lost people. We lost pregnant mothers. We lost children. We lost cancer patients who could not access facilities or radiotherapy. We had to feed people. You saw the challenges we had with distributing food. It was not easy. It wasn't easy for many families. Now, while we now need this lockdown more than ever, there is need to plan properly and put in place measures to ensure that other disease conditions are well attended to. In the first wave, we lost 334 people, but we lost more people to other disease conditions 
than to COVID because of the lockdown. HIV patients could not access their medicines. TB patients could not access their medicines. It was a challenge managing cases of malaria. So right now, we are looking at all those options. And by the way, COVID has affected the economy of many countries. It is a challenge to collect revenue. The resources are not there. Every country is literally struggling. So you cannot tell the head of state to get up and lock. When he locks, what do we hope to achieve? There must be systems in place that will ensure continuity of the other essential services and people will be able to access services. Two, people must eat. What about people who live from hand to mouth? They must eat. So there are lessons that you draw from every intervention that you implement. And the next time that you have to implement it, you must be really prepared. There was no political motivation. You just it was have, the lives Dr. of the Jane, people. You just have, first of all, to protect the lives because, before you even think about the livelihoods. Exactly. There can only be lives, and then, they can have, then you can have livelihoods. Mr. So why don't you think about... Mr. Because the Kamara, situation seems to be dire. His Excellency... That, that, you, that you should be super focused on lives more than livelihoods. Mr. Kamara, recently, His Excellency, the President, issued some directives, right? Did he? Including banning inter-district movements. Tell me what is happening. The districts have started a relay system. The transporters in one district carry passengers and live at the border with the other district. The other ones pick and they continue the relay system. What else have they started? Human beings walking across. Do we have to police people every time for everything when you know there is death in your house? Yes, you do. Because do that's why you have the police and that's why there are enforcement officers. Even when you're told there's a, a snake in your house and it's going to bite you, you're waiting for a police, a policeman to come and kill it. When you're told if you do this, the snake will not bite you, it is very unfortunate. I just heard the other day the inspector general of police saying that if we tell you don't go there and you continue going there, we shall beat you and stop you from getting into danger. Is that because that's how you work. So if you can be able to do that in other areas... I and suppose you can also be able to stop Uganda if you think they are going into And absolutely, a that is the line where we are going to but take. Apart from SOPs, mm. Dr. Chang, yes. what else can the country do? Well, um, Mr. Kamara, prevention is always the cheapest. And the SOPs are all about prevention. But there are other measures that we are taking, and that is risk communication. We have been communicating. Okay educating people on a daily basis, whatever comes up. We give information, not only to the population, to the health workers, to different target groups. What else can we do, apart from risk communication and the SOPs? We treat the sick. And we are treating the sick. It is not easy. Let me tell you this, because many people are not aware I see several headlines. People die, 30 people die in Mulago and so on. But people never ask themselves, what kind of patients come to Mulago? People are referred with oxygen levels as low as 30%, 20%, 15%. My health workers are not Jesus. They are not miracle workers. They try their best. If only people could be admitted early, with better oxygen saturation, perhaps 95, 92. That is something you can, you know, begin to work with. But at 35 and you expect these people to do a miracle, it is next to impossible. You're talking about treating, and yes, quite a number of people are recovering, which is uh, commendable, and maybe it gives us a ray of hope that uh, we can overcome. I but think the population should first appreciate those in intensive care and isolation facilities. They've never gone home. Can you imagine staying away from your home for more than two years and you have families? They've never done that. They can't go home. We can't allow them. But there's another issue. The issue of the hospital bills. I just know of a family right now. They're just clearing about 47 million. I just, I'm told there's another two patients who decided just to escape. I don't know how you even escape from ICU, but... Uh, maybe some people will be able to document it better. They kept because the bill had gone to about 120. 
And I'm told it can go to beyond 200 million and you even die in hospitals in Kampala. For heaven's sake, the NRM government where you belong, how do you expect Ugandans to be able to pay 5 million shillings per day, per day, to take care of these patients? I mean, you are out of touch with all respect with the reality. Mr. Kamara, allow me first of all to condemn that act. And clearly, it is happening in the private sector, not in the public sector. It is very unfortunate that some people are taking advantage of the vulnerable to make money during this time of COVID. This is not a time to make money. This is a time to save lives. From the very beginning, if you will recall, the Ministry of Health took a very long time before bringing on board the private sector because we knew such a thing would happen. And we resisted. We said, get your treatment from the public sector where government is offering you... are overwhelmed. Absolutely. Are desperate. Let me when tell you... When you're in a survival mode and desperate... Do you remember Nanyonga, a woman during the days of HIV AIDS and who uh, had some, some, something called the miracle soil? Mr. And Ugandans Kamara, were eating it because they're desperate and Mr. they have no solution. Mr. Kamara, let me tell you, Mulago has adequate bed capacity. It has 900 beds. The challenge I already told you, people come in when they are critical and they are all scrambling for intensive care unit. Can we get people coming in early and they go to high dependency? The beds are available. So all this talk you hear, Mulago doesn't have beds. Mulago intensive care unit is full with critical cases. But there are other beds. If you don't come when you're critical, we can admit you and attend to you. It is not Mulago's duty to only attend to critical cases. So that is the challenge now. We open up to the private sector and they are charging 5 million per day. Some families have paid up to 200 million and they have lost their loved ones. It is completely unacceptable. And I think the private sector needs to apologize to, this, to, the, to, the, to the people. It is not a time to make money. And you know very but, uh, well but, that but, when but, there but is death, you need before, to save even lives. Even before COVID, Honorable Minister, if somebody got admitted in any of these hospitals around Kampala, even if you're a corporate Ugandan yes. and you have a job and maybe have insurance, mm. it may not be enough for you. That has always been the case. I, 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 know. I, I know you know that, 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 that to all of us are in perpetual vulnerability. Two days, you are finished. You cannot, you cannot be able to pay the bill on the third and the fourth day. So people are just going to wait and sit in their homes and die because you're poor, because they are poor. And that is the majority of Ugandans. It is unfortunate, Mr. Kamara. But let me tell you this. We have isolation facilities all over the country. Every region has an is isolation facility. Let people become responsible and get to hospitals a little early, not when they are critical. Because we don't have all those intensive care unit facilities. And let me tell you, no amount of intensive care unit facilities is going to save us. Even if you put thousands of intensive care unit facilities, if you're going to go in there with an oxygen saturation of 30%, 40%, then you're not helping yourself. You need to go in early. And this is what the population needs to know. Hey, maybe when you recommend for home care kind of thing, some people may not understand at what level do I think I'm now beyond home care. By the time they go to hospital, it's critical because not many people would be able to tell. Sometimes people have been diagnosed and you think you're okay, but the doctor is saying, no, your case is critical. You actually need to be admitted. Yes. And, 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 they, and the patient may not know. So, and you know, it's very difficult for somebody to tell. You're thinking, okay, I'm doing these hormone remedies, I'm taking what... And before you know it yet, your lungs or your systems, or your organs are, are failing. And you can't, you're not going to be able to know. Absolutely, Mr. Kamara. And this is what we have been talking about and training our village health teams to be able to detect within the populations and advise people accordingly. Once you become symptomatic 
and you have a fever that is persisting, it is not going down, and the cough is increasing, don't wait to start having difficulty in breathing. Come, come for triage, and we'll tell you whether you can continue on home-based care, or we need to admit you. Come for triage. There also seems to have been an increased wave of flu and cough and malaria that was reported. I'm not a medical officer, but you're a, 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 med a medical doctor and the Minister of Health. Hmm. I wonder whether you have been able to notice that, or maybe it is actually COVID. Uh, Mr. Kamara, we, call, uh, we, we carry out what we call influenza surveillance. Yes on a routine basis. And uh, we started this many years ago. Um, so our scientists, you know, follow this up to see what kind of influenza it is, and uh, they inform us accordingly. Yes, it is true there has been a wave, and we are waiting for a report from them. But it has also coincided with COVID. So my best message to the population is any form of upper respiratory tract infection, flu, cough, and whatever, treat it as COVID until it is proved otherwise. There are not many areas where people can go and do tests, uh, the PCR tests. Um, and if you wanted to do it on, you know, pay money, it's extremely, again, very expensive. Mm -hmm. I paid 180,000 Uganda shillings at a test site somewhere in Bogolobi. And I'm thinking, who is going to get 180,000 shillings um, that easy? Because if me, I'm also paying through the nose, I'm feeling it. Mm -hmm. There are quite a number of Ugandans who can feel the same pain, or even some people who may not even be able to manage. Right. Do, do you really think about those Ugandans? Yes, we do, Mr. Kamara. At this point in time, we have over 25 laboratories all over the country that carry out the PCR tests. But uh, what is uh, important for the population to know is that the PCR test kits are not cheap. They are extremely expensive. And that is why the private sector charges what it does, although sometimes it is exorbitant. Now, those laboratories all over the country are able to handle our alert cases. An alert means you have got developed signs and symptoms and you need to be helped. In the public sector, the test is free of charge. Two, because we cannot only rely on the PCR test, our government made available what we call the rapid antigen tests, which are also available in all the districts. But I'm told they're and not so reliable. Well, um, it is not that they are not reliable, but scientifically we've been advised that again you use it to test those who are symptomatic. Now, if you test somebody and they test negative, then you have to take that sample and have it confirmed in a PCR laboratory. But it is good because if I already have symptoms and I am tested using the antigen test and I am positive, then I know for sure I am positive Why and I need to be helped. Is there any kind of plan to have mass testing? of Ugandans. So that we, you send your team across these villages and then you can get a clear picture of where we stand. That would be the ideal Mr. Kamara. However, the, test, the PCR test kits are also not readily available even if you had the money to buy. And like I said, they are extremely expensive. If we are to direct all our resources to PCR tests, we wouldn't be able to do everything that we need. So now you have only 25 laboratories that can do PCR across the country. Across the country. Under the travel restrictions that we have, how do you expect Ugandans to move and get the tests if there are 25 in a 140 something districts? It means some people may need to cross districts and yet there's a restriction on that. There is no need to cross districts because um, um, under the Ministry of Health, we have 14 regions, and we are talking about 25 laboratories, which means every region has an access yeah, to a laboratory. Yeah, but every region is, does not mean every district. No, the every region are does not mean... The stopping, are stopping it, districts from interacting. Exactly, so but... So how do you expect them to go we don't. We 25? don't expect individuals to walk to the PCR laboratories. What happens is that the surveillance officers in every district have sample removers 
and they remove samples and transport these so samples. You, so you can go to a district, your district, and get this, and the sample is taken Absolutely. from you. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and Dr. it's Dr. Chen, we're going to take a break, and uh, on the spot, we'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is Honorable Dr. Jen Acheng, Minister Dexnet for Health. And we're discussing the pandemic and how it is, you know, disrupting lives. And the situation is quite dire for Uganda. You say you have been testing people, but that is something I've also observed. For example, people like you, with all respect, you may find in one month or in two months you have taken tests maybe three or four times. Well, some of our people here in the newsroom, like reporters, uh, since the elections began, probably they have done 30 or 40 tests. And uh, members of parliament, before you meet, you test. Before you go to meet the president, you test. Before you go to Chamkwanzi, you test. And, and all these people are put together in the statistics of the people whom you are testing. And yet it's recurrent. So I think there's a danger in our statistics about the people you're testing. And uh, when you keep on saying you have tested so many, we also have a recurrent numbers of people with all respect, like you, who are doing tests every now and then. I've also done two tests, and most of them were because I needed to go somewhere, and, and you, you were mandated to do that test. So are the numbers deceptive? Uh, Mr. Kamara, those are called number of tests done, not number of people tested. Because the numbers of tests done translate to some form of money or resources used to procure the test. However, it is also important to note that there are some people who are in the line of danger much more than others. And these are the people that you need to test to be sure. Look, if we were really adhering to the standard operating procedures, your parents in the village wouldn't be in the line of danger, really. Because danger is taken to them. They don't look for it. The danger is actually in the hot spots that are really busy, like Kampala City, like Wakiso, like Mukono, and then the urban towns in the different regions, which many are now cities as well. So that is where we would be concentrating. Unfortunately, because people fail to understand the importance of prevention, Infection has spread to the entire country and to every village. And that therefore requires that we need to enhance our testing capacity, which we are only doing through the rapid test kits. Because as I said before, the PCR tests are extremely expensive. Okay. So on the front of vaccine, I, I know uh, we have vaccinated almost um, closer to a million people. But now we don't have vaccines anymore. Today, I think you had 175,000 more doses coming in of AstraZeneca. So if those doses come in, majority of those who have been vaccinated have just taken their single, their first jab. So who is going to be eligible? Are you going to continue with the new people coming in? Or you'll cater for those who are due for their second jab? Because now that number of those who are due is actually increasing. Mm. I'm actually myself, I'm also due for my second you will get your second dose, uh, um, uh, Mr. Kamara. But let me first say this. We started our vaccination program with uh, priority groups. Why did we choose priority groups? These are groups in the line of duty that, you know, are exposed to infection, like the health workers. We brought on board the teachers because they interact with our children and we needed to protect our children. The security personnel, these are the people enforcing, you know, the SOPs and they are everywhere they interact with us. The vulnerable people with comorbidities and the elderly. Now, when we have gotten these vaccines, the question you would ask me, are you going to set a new priority group? No, because we did not cover all the health workers. Out of the 150,000 health workers that we plan to vaccinate, we only vaccinated about 69,000. So there are still health workers there who need to be vaccinated. 
And now more than ever, they must get vaccinated. Because people go to them, sick people go to them, and you cannot know what a sick person is suffering from. We need to get our teachers vaccinated because we need our children back in school. We have already lost two years. People need to see the importance of getting vaccinated. However, science has shown that even one dose, one dose is better than nothing at all. And that is why from the very beginning, we encourage people, go get the single dose. I mean the one dose. So that if we get vaccines, then you will be able to get your second so dose. So wait a minute. Are, are you saying that with the doses that we have gotten now, when you continue vaccinating, you'll be considering the new arrivals or those who are due for their second job? Those who are due for their second job will get their second job. Will it be the first in line? The health workers will be the first in line and the teachers. But we are not going to consume all those vaccines on them alone. Those who are due for their second dose will get the second dose. You know why dose. I'm asking this? Because, because you the, have, the doses you have are over 800,000 people who have Ex taken their first job. Yes, job, yes, Mr. And you have now added in 175,000, which Mi means Mr. the 800,000 will need another 800,000 doses. Exactly, and I have more vaccines on the way coming. And I keep on telling Ugandans, we will get the vaccines. We have another 688,000 so doses coming. So if you go coming. beyond your due date, um, it doesn't cause you trouble? You have time between 8 weeks to 12 weeks to get vaccinated. If you push it to 15 weeks, it is still okay. You will still get vaccinated. And uh, you're a medical doctor and you're saying that one job can somehow give you some help. It's better than nothing. So how many have completed their second job? And, uh, so not, far, no, do you have an idea? No, 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 not very many. I would put that at a little over 8,000 people. 8,000 people? Over. A little over 8,000 people who have completed the second job. But, but you understand if we have 800,000 Ugandans taking their first job and they, are, they need to, to take two, and you're saying only 8,000 have completed. You, you see, Mr. Our, Kamara, you know, the Dr. good Chen. news is that we don't take the jobs on the same day. So we don't all reach the time for the second job I at understand. the same time. Yes. It is varied. And that is the beauty of it. Like it my is case, varied. I need to take my second job on 29th of July. Exactly. And you will be able to get your second job. And many others who took with you will be able to get their second job. Then there are those who took a week after or two weeks after. They will also be coming on board as the vaccines are coming in. So now, you, the other day police arrested people with vaccines. It's not possible for every day Ugandan to access government stores. It's people working within the ministry, people in the government, who have access to government stores. It's, you know, demoralizing to hear such stuff. Yes, Mr. Kamara, absolutely very demoralizing, very painful to many of us who would like to see Ugandans protected. Now, I will say this. Again, when we started the vaccination program, we wanted to limit it to the public sector because with the public sector, we can give directives and it is followed. And we agreed that the vaccines are absolutely free of charge. Many people in the private sector or many private sector actors spoke to us and said, give us vaccines. We said, we'll only give you vaccines if you are willing to give it out free of charge. Now, you may be aware that we carry out immunization the routine immunization for children with the support of the private sector. The refrigerators they have is property of government. And they give vaccines to children. Again, the agreement is give it free of charge because this is a preventive intervention that needs to get out to the people. And so basing on that, our KCCA 
distributed some vaccines to the private sector to issue it out to the people free of charge. What do we hear some days later? Some private sector actors are selling the vaccines. And then others tell us that we have used all the doses. They balance their books to zero when they have vaccines in their stores. Then they begin to sell because they no longer have to give accountability. But you see, when you balance, you have to balance it against the numbers of people that you have vaccinated. If I am keen, I will see that the number of vials I gave you and the number of people you have vaccinated are not telling. And that is why we had to move in and find out what was going on. So it is not that they accessed it through the wrong route. They accessed the vaccines through the normal channels that we give. But there was no truth. There was no transparency. So there has been money given through your ministry to buy vaccines yes. and also through the COVAX uh, vaccine sharing program of the United Nations, we're also supposed to be getting vaccines. So if you have the money, um, what, what is the issue? Is it the pharmaceutical industries that are not able to provide? Uh, Mr. Kamara, the production of vaccines has been low to meet the global demand. It is too low. And there is a lot of scramble for vaccines all over the world. Because of low production, Many of the rich countries buy off the vaccines before the poor countries can get the vaccines. Our government gave us money. First, we had five million U.S. dollars to buy vaccines. Just before we could, you know, pay for the vaccines, India had a crisis. And India said, no, we are not giving vaccines anymore. Subsequently, our government gave us more, 23 billion Uganda shillings. Add that and buy vaccines. And we tried many of the manufacturers, but they are saying we have huge orders, we are not able to give vaccines. So we made a decision to pay for vaccines and tell them we are joining the queue, we have paid for the vaccines. Our government has again been very generous. We have 85 billion Uganda shillings in the budget of the coming financial year, again for vaccines. Now, working with the COVAX facility, we are pushing and saying, please, we have the money. Give us the vaccines. And don't limit us to only AstraZeneca. If you can give us Pfizer, we also have children that need to be vaccinated. If we can have Johnson & Johnson give it to us, we will know the populations where to give the vaccines. And so we are working around the clock. We are also expecting uh, the donation from the Chinese government that we previously spoke about. The 300,000 doses, it will come in soon, again to be given to a certain population. But and no. research has now shown that actually if you get AstraZeneca, you can later on combine it with another vaccine. So oh, that is okay. The jar. Yes. So now, because the issue of, of vaccines are on a global scale, I, the other day I was following the, the G8 summit and the United States was... Uh, saying they're going to give 500, 500 million doses, uh, half a billion doses, and, and all of them combined, I think they are promising about one, one billion doses, but, but that's less than 10% of what is required. Enough. But even then, that can also be stretched maybe in the next one year for it to come. So uh, when the rich countries cannot even go beyond 10%, and even that 10% they are giving can take more than a year, do you really think you'll be able to meet your targets of the number? Though I need to know how many people you need to have vaccinated to, to know that we are good enough to go. Do you really need to think you're going to reach there? Because it's not in our hands anymore. You see, Mr. Kamara, first of all, you have to take note that the vaccines that we are receiving now was bought by the rich countries. They were hoarding them. Along the journey, they have realized they bought excessive vaccines and they have to distribute to give away. And we are receiving it as African countries. That is why the vaccines come in with a very short shelf life, because it took time in those countries. There must be equity in distribution of vaccines if we are to win the fight against COVID-19. Why can't uh, governments in Africa, and since you're a cabinet minister through the AU, think about 
you know, the waiver of the patents so that African pharmaceutical industries can be given the leeway to produce the vaccines here. I think, Mr. Kamara, you're very much aware that African countries have asked for that waiver. We have asked for that waiver. And when it finally comes, which I, and I'm hoping it will come, it may be a little late. We have asked for that waiver. But you know the intricacies around all that. So, so that is why we keep on saying, can there be equity? Can we put a human face to this? Knowing that if there is infection in Uganda, it will still spread out to the entire world. And so an infection anywhere means we are all still in danger. And unless we all agree to that and support one another and ensure that even the African countries have adequate vaccines, it's going to take us a bit of a while to overcome the COVID pandemic. How many people need to be vaccinated to protect the Ugandan population? And how is the ministry working towards that goal? Because in a population of about 40 million, uh, how many do we need to know that if we vaccinate this number, then perhaps we are good to go? Uh, what you're referring to is what we call herd immunity. And herd immunity usually looks at 85% of the target population. Our target population has been 22 million people above 18 years of age. That was then. Mr. Kamara, right now, you also know very well that our children are getting infected. And along the way, children may also need to be vaccinated. Research is still ongoing as to whether children can be vaccinated with the available vaccines. In some countries, children are being given the Pfizer vaccine for children between 12 to 17 years. But infection is being found in children as low as two weeks. So there is still a lot that we don't understand about COVID-19 and about you know, what happens in the population, its progress and so on and so forth. Science will continue to teach us about COVID-19. However, if out of the 22 million people that we target to vaccinate, we can vaccinate 85% of them. That would be good. At the speed on which we are running, uh, that will really take some time. The, well, the speed is not, the problem with the speed is not inside the country, is with access to the vaccines. We've already placed orders. If these orders come in now, I am very sure that our health workers would run the race to get the vaccines to the people. We have had reports of stockouts of PPEs. Uh, to be precise, I think I've had it in Busia, in Tororo, and other regional referral hospitals. Mm. What is the ministry doing to get uh, health workers the protection they need in this fight? Mr. Kamara, first of all, we must thank His Excellency, the President, who saw the need to have the PPEs manufactured in the country. So we have PPEs being manufactured in Uganda. We have gloves being manufactured in Uganda. All the protective wear we need. However, they are not cheap, they are expensive. And you know very well that the more critical cases you have, and when I talk about critical, I hope you can picture the kind of patients I'm talking about. The more PPEs you will need. Those PPEs are not easy to wear. When people don them and go in, they can't stay for long. They need to come out and discard. So you can imagine the volume of PPEs that is used in Mulago on a daily basis. And then translate that to the entire country. It is in billions of shillings. One time we sat down and somebody told us that it takes about 85 million shillings every day to look after a 